This is a short video about section 2.5.1 in Stein's book on elementary number theory, and it's about polynomials over the field Z mod PC. I'll tell you what that word field is uh, right now. So before we jump into the first paragraph of the section here, let's do a little example. And let's say I've got the real numbers say, and I'll take those to be my coefficients and what I'm allowed to say plug in for in the following polynomial. What I'm interested in is like, you know, what are the roots of something like x squared minus one? And what do I know that I could do? Well, I know that there are exactly two answers to this. It has roots, or zeros, whatever you want to say, x equals 1 and x equals minus 1. Great. Nothing new. That's something we do in college algebra all the time. What if I considered my polynomial f here over something that's not r? What if I considered it over this goofy z mod 8z, so the integers mod 8? So over z mod 8z, let's look at this same polynomial, f of x equals x squared minus 1. And so uh, in particular, right, like here, I'm considering 1 as a real number, but uh, here, and, and the coefficient on x, of course, also, but uh, here I'm considering 1 as like the equivalence class of 1 mod 8, and similarly with the coefficient on x. Okay, so let's think about what are the roots here. So what are the roots? Well, I've got a bunch of them, actually. Uh, so in the book lists them out right here, 1, 3, 5, and 7, but let's check them. So it has roots 1, I'll say x equals 1, x equals 3, x equals 5, and x equals 7. So what are we saying here? Here I'm saying that f of 1 is equal to 1 squared minus 1, which is 0. Well, of course it is. But the maybe more interesting or less intuitive, f of 3, f of 3 is 3 squared minus 1, that's 9 minus 1, which is 8, oh, which is 0 mod 8. So that's where the weirdness comes in. Remember, we're taking our answers and we're always reducing stuff mod 8. So that's how I get that 3 is a 0. Similarly here, when you plug in 5, f of 5 is 24, and that's 0 mod 8. And then similarly, uh, f of 7 is 48, and that's 0 mod 8 as well. So what do I want to highlight here? Well, over the real numbers, like, you know, if you teach a college algebra class, the number of roots you had is less than or equal to the degree of the polynomial. In other words, a polynomial of degree D has at most D roots. But if we start working with polynomials over some, you know, more generally like a weird ring like Z mod 8C, then this polynomial of degree two has much more than two roots. It's got four roots. So what's going on here it's because of the structure of these two things. They're both rings. The real numbers are a ring. I can add stuff and multiply, and the uh, Z mod 8Z is a good ring too. You can add stuff and multiply. Of course, there's a little bit more that goes into being a ring, but in general, just think of those two operations. Some weird stuff that goes on in Z mod 8Z though. So for instance, what's something weird that happens? What happens if you take two times four in Z mod 8Z? Well, cool, we get eight, cool. You're making a video about that? Wait a minute, Z mod 8Z, that's zero. So think about what just happened. Two non-zero things just multiplied to give me zero. Makes my brain hurt. That doesn't happen in the real numbers. In the real numbers, I have, remember, what was called the zero product property, which, again, to some of you teachers, you have your students use this all the time. When they factor a polynomial, how come they can just set each factor equal to zero? Well, it's because of the zero product property. If a times b equals zero for the real numbers, say, then, of course, you could assume or conclude a equals zero or b equals zero. So what we just showed, or what we're angling at here, the real numbers have the zero product property. Z mod 8c does not have that zero product property, right? These are definitely two non-zero things that gave me zero. And there's one more thing here. Because you have these, what are called zero divisors, two and four, you'd call them zero divisors in like a modern algebra class. Because the Z mod 8c has zero divisors, um, it also doesn't necessarily have multiplicative, not every element has a multiplicative inverse. Whereas for the real numbers, every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse, right? You can take reciprocals and you still get a real number. Or in other words, uh, you could still, you could divide by any real number and still get a real number. So kind of all together, that makes the real numbers a field. So a field is a ring that, you know, you can multiply in any order and it has one. I didn't really talk about those, but those are givens. But the more important thing is along with addition and multiplication, you should be able to divide by non-zero things and stay within your set. So the real numbers are a field. Z minus 8Z is not a field. It's kind of gross. If you've had some modern algebra, just to remind you of like the hierarchy of some of this stuff, uh, fields are 
a more specific example of what's called an integral domain. And uh, integral domains and fields, they're all specific examples of commutative rings that have a unity. It's commutative rings with one, I'll say. And so we just said a good field is the real numbers, if you want to think about that. Uh, so you should also read this as the real numbers are an integral domain also, and the real numbers are a commutative ring with one also. So with another word for one or the identity element, the multiplicative identity, you might call that unity. A good example of an integral domain that's not a field are the good old integers, right? So like two does not have a multiplicative inverse. You'd need a half, and that's not an integer. So that's why the integers are not a field. And we just saw that out here, something like z mod 8z is a commutative ring that is neither an integral domain nor a field. So again, if you've had some modern algebra, you should recognize this picture. If you haven't, just kind of keep it in the back of your mind. So what we're going to look at is what can we say about polynomials? Um, in particular, we'll stick to the case that it's z mod pz most of the time, but we'll kind of highlight some of the weirdness when this modulus p is not prime. We'll look at some of that. So the first thing we'll look at is 2.5.3, we'll call it the root bound. And this says if f is a polynomial uh, whose coefficients come from a field k, and just we'll keep the variable as x. That's all you should think about this. So this is the notation for the polynomial ring over a field k. So like if you teach a college algebra class, you are probably working in qx or maybe more generally in rx most of the time. I'm just saying your coefficients are probably like rational numbers, and sometimes maybe you put coefficients as real numbers. Okay, so that's that. And let's say that it's a non-zero polynomial over that field. Well, then that polynomial should have at most degree of f roots. So I guess this all says that polynomial has at most degree of f roots. So there should be at most degree of f elements alpha in the field such that f of alpha gives you zero. And again, that's what that says alpha is a root. All right, so how do we prove this? So we're saying that our logic here, that you should have at most degree of f elements that are roots. How do we prove that? So what we'll do is we'll do it by induction. And so the base cases are when you have degree zero or degree one, and those are fine. So let's start. We don't, uh, the book didn't write down what the inductive hypothesis is, but we'll assume the inductive hypothesis is to assume that any polynomial of degree n minus one has at most n minus one roots. And so what we're going to play with is a polynomial of degree n and try to show that it has at most n roots. So if f had no roots already, if f has no roots, then no roots is consistent with at most degree f roots. So that holds. So let's assume that f has a root. Let's call it alpha. Well, let's think of a slick way to rewrite f of x. f of x would be the same thing as f of x minus 0 right? f of alpha is 0. So if I subtract 0 from f of x, that doesn't hurt anything. What that allows me to do, if you think about, if you were to plop this expression, uh, if you were to put this expression right here, and then also think about what happens when you replace all the x's here with alphas and plop that expression here, you've got a bunch of things that look the same. The only difference is x's and alphas. So in particular, you should be able to pull an an off of those corresponding powers of x and alpha. And you should be able to do that everywhere. And at the very last part, they both just have a0 in them, right? When you plug in alpha to this, the a0 sticks around. And so it's already here when you have x into it. And so at the end, you don't get a constant term. So in particular, what can you do? What I want you to notice is that really that's not there. So that for every one of these, you could factor off an x minus alpha here. Right? If you think about x to the n minus alpha to the n, you could factor off an x minus alpha to that, or um, x minus alpha from that. All the way down the list, in this one, you could pull the x minus alpha off too. So x minus alpha comes off of every one of these. There it is right there. And you're left with some gross looking polynomial like this. And we're gonna name that gross polynomial g of x. So, so far what we've done is we've factored f of x equals x minus alpha times g of x. If you teach college algebra, that's like the factor theorem, right? If alpha is a root, then x minus alpha is a factor. So we're using that right there. Or I guess we kind of just proved that it's true for this general case. Okay, so let's think about, well, what if f has another root? Let's say f has another root named beta, and let's assume that beta is not alpha. Well, think about this then. If f of beta is equal to zero, um, well, here's another expression for f of x. What if you plugged beta in for that x there? That would look like beta minus alpha times g of beta, and we're assuming that that's equal to zero. Hence, this equals zero. So if we think about this part right here, 
this is where we are using the fact I have two things that multiply to zero. Because I know that we're in a field, I know that these are both elements of this field K. That means that we have the zero product property. There's no zero divisor nonsense like in Z8. So we can conclude that if the product's zero, at least one of the factors has to be zero. Now, beta is not the same thing as alpha. Therefore, this can't be zero. That forces G of beta to be zero. So G of beta has to be zero. So since G has some roots and it has degree n minus one, the inductive hypothesis applies to G so that G has at most n minus one roots as well. Thus, it has n minus roots that are different from alpha, and the only other choice for a root has to be alpha. Therefore, F has at most n, it has at most n roots altogether. Alpha, and then plus the n minus one possibilities for what beta could be by the inductive hypothesis. The next little piece here is how we can have Sage do some, some work in some polynomial rings for us. So this is the command to tell Sage that I want to look at polynomials over the ring um, z mod 13z. Notice 13 is a prime, that's fine, but this, this is really building this ring here, z mod 13z, and then the notation for a polynomial ring, if you read it in a book, is consistent with this here. So that's telling Sage to make this ring here. And then this is just maybe some convenient, we'll name it this, just so it's easy to, it's easier for me to type the thing in green on the left than it is for me to write out polynomial ring blah 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 every time I want to use it. So once we set that, uh, once we set that in Sage, then what we'll do is maybe we'll make a polynomial. Let's name it just F. And you see I've got F is x to the 15th plus 1 here. Um, so Sage is considering this polynomial in this polynomial ring, and it's already knowing that I want the coefficients to be reduced mod 13. So it's only using those coefficients 0 through 12. And so Sage has some built-in things. We can use this roots here. It's like an attribute on this polynomial, if that makes any sense to some Python people. Um, f dot roots, what it'll do, it'll just find the roots of this polynomial in z mod 13z. And so you get 12, maybe I'll say it this way. It looks like I've got three three things here, a list of three things, and how I should read them. 12 is a root, and its multiplicity is one. So how this is always gonna spit stuff out is it, what's the root, comma, what's its multiplicity? Remember, multiplicity is how often a root occurs. So 12 is a root, 10 is a root, four is a root, and it looks like they each have multiplicity one. And just as a check, f of 12, we expect it to be zero, since Sage just told me it was a root, and yes, I get that it's zero. So Sage can do some of this cool stuff and some of these weird rings for us. That's pretty cool. So the next thing we want to look at um, is what if you've got a prime now? And so I guess the big thing, if you've seen some modern algebra, z mod pz, or maybe you've seen this instead written as just z subscript p, whatever. Whenever that modulus is prime, that's a field. Z mod pz is a field. It's a nice, it's a nice ring, and it has kind of similar properties as the real numbers. There's no weird zero divisor nonsense, and I've got that zero product property and everybody has a multiplicative, every non-zero buddy has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so that's our setting here. P is a prime, and let's say D is a number that divides P minus one. So if you think P is prime, one less of it, probably even, and so of course it's got some divisors. Okay, let's look at this polynomial, X to the D minus one. Very specific polynomial, just X to a power, then minus one, no other powers of X in between. This polynomial, considered over Z mod PZ, has exactly d roots. So that polynomial has exactly degree d roots. So above we had kind of a general thing where any, poly any polynomial has at most degree of f roots, whereas this particular polynomial has exactly degree of f roots. I hope you see the similarities, but also the subtle difference between these two propositions. So this is a, another kind of fun proof, similar to the one above, we're gonna define e to b, what do you get when you do p minus 1 divided by d? Remember, d was defined to be a divisor of p minus 1, so e makes sense. So if you move this d over, if you multiply that over, that says that d is equal to p, d times e is p minus 1. So let's look at this polynomial, x to the p minus 1 minus 1. We just logic out that if I solve this for p minus 1, I get d times e. And what we're going to do now is we're going to factor this thing. We're going to factor an x to the d off of all this. And if I factor, sorry, we're going to factor x to the d minus 1 out of all this. x to the d minus 1 is pulled off of this. And what do you have left? You have this gross looking polynomial here. And if you don't believe it, go ahead and like start reverse distributing. So like here, when you multiply these, uh, these back out, 
you should see that that's x to the d times x to the de minus d. And when you use your exponent rules, well, those d's cancel, and you do get x to the d minus e back. So I, again, if you don't believe that factorization holds, go ahead and start distributing to convince yourself. So this is a good way to factor that polynomial, and this brings the polynomial in question into the picture here. And you might be wondering, well, what'd you start with this one for? And it's because I actually know a lot about x to the p minus one minus one also. So, so far I've factored it as x to the d minus one times somebody named g. And uh, what else do I know? The degree of g, well, g, he's not secret, g's right here. And its degree is right here, d, e minus d. Think about d, e though, move this d over, d, e is p minus one. So the degree of d, degree of g, which is d, e minus d, is the same thing as p minus one minus d. So keep that in your mind for right now. So degree of g is p minus one minus d. Now, why are we looking at this polynomial, x to the p minus one, all minus one? Well, remember Euler's theorem. Euler's theorem is theorem 2.120, which told us that uh, the congruence x to the phi of n is always congruent to one mod n. And in particular, when n's a prime like p, remember phi of n is just one less of that prime. In other words, a specific case of Euler's theorem is when n is prime. That says x to the p minus one is congruent to one mod p. Now move that one over x to the p minus one minus one is congruent to zero mod p. So what did we just say? That's always true for every, every element, uh, every non-zero element mod p. So how many non-zero elements are there mod p? There's p minus one of them. So what do we know? I know that this polynomial x to the p minus one all minus one I know that this has exactly p minus one roots. But what we just showed is we can factor it into these two pieces. And now what we're gonna use is another property of a field. So another property of z mod pz being a field is, I guess I'll get to that in just one moment. So my, my product here has p minus one roots. This factor g of x, it has degree p minus one minus d, by the previous proposition, g has at most that many roots. So if this has p minus one roots, and this has p minus uh, one minus d roots, how many roots does this have to have? Well, I know that this plus the number of roots of this has to add up to p minus one. It has to be d. x to the d minus one has to have d roots because that makes d here, when you add these together, you recover p minus one. So that's the idea of the proof here about why x to the d minus one has to have exactly d roots. Just to emphasize that a little bit here, um, if I decide to play with the integers mod 13, if I look at x to the six plus one, that's a pretty similar polynomial to uh, one of these guys up here. And anyway, if I tell Sage to go ahead and find the roots for me, I see I get one, two, three, four, five, six roots, and that matches what the degree is. Now, this last step here, where I'm counting the degree of this product has to be the sum of the, the, I'm sorry, how should I say this? The number of roots in the product has to be the sum of the number of roots in each factor. That's a property of a field. So to show you that that need not happen, right? To show you that need not happen, think about x squared minus one over z mod 15z. 15 is composite, it's bad. Composite number like that, not good bad in the context we're playing with. It's not prime. So this thing, it definitely factors as x minus one, x squared minus one still factors as x minus one, x plus one. Well, the only root of this factor is x equals one, and the only root of this factor is x minus one. However, if you were to actually find the roots of just x squared minus one, the product, you get more than just those two roots. You get four and you get 11 also. If you think about, let's just do, if you plug four in, that would be 16 minus one, which is zero mod 15. So what does that say? Because 15 is, not, is composite, remember that says that this is not a field. Therefore, the number of roots of each factor need not add up to the number of roots of the overall polynomial. So some of that, maybe common sense because we teach a lot over a field, kind of breaks down. We need to be a little bit more careful, a little bit more careful about what we're doing. But we're able to use this property up here again because when P is a prime, that's when I do have that good property.